Well, happy, happy Easter. Anybody get to go hunt some eggs yesterday or today? Any egg hunters? My little man, Josiah, he's two. He had his little little bucket, uh, and he decided to fill it up with a dump truck. I think he, he had his eggs in there as well, but I think he had a dump truck. I think he had like an ambulance in there. Uh, I think he had a, a backhoe. Uh, he had a lot of good, good, good stuff there for Easter. Uh, but happy Resurrection Sunday. Come on. Come on. You know, I, I, isn't it amazing that and awesome for us that no matter how wild the world's going, how chaotic things may be, how destructive and chaos and confusion uh, could, could be filling the streets, but that Jesus is still on the throne, that there is just still hope, that there is hope and that God is still moving on the planet. You know, I, I was thinking about it. I was having a conversation not too long ago with Joaquin, and we were just talking about, he was just talking about how, um, you know, it doesn't seem like right now there's like some big revival happening on the planet. Um, but God is still moving. And that I, I feel like the, and I, I look in the room, and I just, I see the faithful. I see the ones in this season, in this day, that uh, have still, how, how many know that Jesus is on the throne? But the question is, is, is he on the throne of my heart? Is he, he's on the throne. It's true. He's up there right now. He's, 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 he's over everything. He has all power. Uh, but for us, for me and you, the question is, is, is he on the throne of my heart? And uh, if you're here on an Easter Sunday, there's probably a pretty good chance he is. <laughs> that he is on, that there's people that uh, are still yielded to this king. And, uh, and, and I believe that the greatest days, and I really do believe this in my heart, that the greatest days of the church are still in front of her. That, that God is, is he's coming back for a, a church that I believe is going to be in revival. That is going to come back for a church that is, is burning and that is having kingdom impact on the earth. And, um, and I, I really believe that. that God is, is moving and is going to move and is still moving and he's on the throne. And I'm excited uh, to communicate this morning just about the resurrection of Jesus. And I really want to talk about the, the fruit or the result of the resurrection. Really the, the purpose of why Jesus did what he did. And <clears throat> the good news is, is he did that because he loves you. He did that because of you. He did that when he was on that cross, carrying his cross, on the cross. All of that was, was because of his love. You know, it wasn't the nails that kept him on the cross. It was love that kept him on the cross. He could have stepped off the cross any time he wanted to. He, he, even, uh, he even told Pilate, he said, look, pretty much, Pilate, I know that you, you feel like it's your authority that you're here, that you're the one that's giving them the authority to crucify me. But the truth is, is that power has actually been given to me that I actually have all power and that I'm choosing to do this, that this is, this is actually an act of, of me, of choice, because I want to lay down my life so that I can reconcile people back to me. And that he did that actively, powerfully choosing you and me. And so that's what we get to celebrate today, that, that Jesus, you know, he wasn't just a, another figure. He wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't just a prophet. He, he wasn't uh, just a, a, a good teacher of the old that spoke a lot of truth. He was the son of God. He was the, the living son of God. And, and I want to read this in, in Paul's words. I think he says this so well. And, and this is also my heart for you this morning. But in Ephesians, you don't have to go there. I'm just going to read this. Ephesians 1, starting in verse 17. Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Who wants that this morning? The spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's, that's a heart that we have is that, that this would actually get inside of us, that I personally would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? So that you may know him better. Amen. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his inglorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparable 
great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Listen to this. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but guess what? In the ages to come. And God placed all things, everybody say all, all things, things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Jesus is on the throne. What I loved about Jesus, this is something that always moves my heart about him. When I read about him and even just experience his presence in my own life is what amazed me about him is Jesus didn't come to the earth and parade around and, and, and show everybody how great he is. You know, he didn't come and manipulate people into loving him. He didn't come and strong arm people into serving him and following him. He didn't come with this iron fist and say, you know, bow down to me. He didn't, he actually walked amongst the people and he, he served and he gave and he healed and he delivered and he just freely demonstrated the love and the kingdom of God. You know, it always amazes me that even when he would go around that he didn't say, hey, have you been reading your Bible? Have you been studying the Old Testament? Have you been going to the synagogue? If you have, then I'll heal you. He just went around and he healed them all. He just demonstrated love and he didn't force anybody into relationship with him. He just invited them into it. He didn't just come with this strong arm, but he demonstrated love and gave all of us a choice to follow him. Isn't that an amazing king? Like he could have come. He could have come and, and, and done that. But he came in humility, and he came just sowing seed and saying, I love you, and I'm here for you, and invited people into relationship. You know, there's, there's no other king like Jesus. There's no other king like the king that we serve. I want to read the verses. You know this, and, and it, uh, we celebrated this on Good Friday. But in John 19, verse 28 and 30, this is the, the, the famous words that Jesus uttered on the cross. And it's in verse 30, 28, and this is John 19, 28. He says, later knowing that everything had been finished and so that the scripture would be, be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. I think it's powerful that Jesus said this. So he's on the cross and he, he says, I'm thirsty. And they get him a, a drink of, of wine and vinegar. Probably not the best tasting thing there. A jar of wine and vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it. And I, I believe that, you know, personally, I think he, he was thirsty, but I think he wanted to powerfully declare what he's about to say. I think he wanted to be able to say it clearly. And so he gets a drink and put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You know what's neat about this? In the Greek, um, this, this definition means to bring to an end, to complete, to accomplish. What's, what's interesting about this is in the Greek, it's a perfect tense. It's, it's a verb, and it's a perfect tense. You know, a past, if it was past tense, past tense means that something happened, that it was, it was accomplished and it was done. But a perfect tense in the Greek it perfect tense speaks of an action that has been completed in the past with results continuing into the present. Isn't that awesome? In, it, so it's a, something that happened in the past with results continuing into the present. It indicates an ongoing result. So when Jesus said, it is finished, it was finished in the past, it was finished in the present, and it's going to be finished tomorrow. Like it's finished once and for all. And what, what's awesome about Jesus is he's got the best benefits package in the world. <laughs> he's got the best benefits package. You know, David, just to, to give some scripture to this, uh, I, I love this. David said uh, in Psalms 103, he says, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name, praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. 
who forgives us of all our sin and heals us of all your disease, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Yeah, God's got the best benefits package. I know I say that kind of funnily in, in a funny way, but but it, it's it's so true what God has done for you and me. And there's somewhere that I'm going today, but I want to I want to hit this for a second that the the benefits that God has given us is it it's ridiculous. It's it's unbelievable what God has done for us. It's it's wild that. On the cross and, and through the resurrection, that He has forgiven us of our sins, that He has washed our sins away, and that He has redeemed us, and that He is through His work. This is a gift that He has given us. It's a gift of salvation. He gives us this gift of righteousness. That when we believe in him, that our sins are forgiven and he makes us right with God. And he sets us free in this. That he actually removes the power of sin against us. Do you know that, you, you have, that we have been set free from the grip of sin? You know what the, what the cross and the resurrection did? It disempowered the enemy and it empowered you. It disempowered the, the grasp that the enemy had on you. It actually, it, it cut the, the power, the authority that the enemy had over you, and it empowered you. And it gave us the ability to be set free from sin. Not, not only are we set free from sin, but it says, and I'm going to read this in a minute, that he, he actually delivered us from our old self. That, that we, are, we are no longer of the sinful nature, but he has now made us righteous. That he crucified the old self. And that we have been raised with Christ. And now we are a new creation in him. And all of this is not by our work, not by our effort, not by our own ability, not by our ability to read the Bible, pray, sing, dance, all of that. It's all because of his work of grace. It's all because of the work that he did on the cross and that this is just a gift that he gives to us. That's a good benefit. That's amazing that he does this for us. Let me read this um, <clears throat> in, in Romans, Romans 6, 5 through, I'll read 5 through 11. But listen to this as on Resurrection Sunday. For if you have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self, guess what? That old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Did you catch that? For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Guess what? You're not a slave to sin anymore. You're not a slave to sin anymore because of the cross, because of what Jesus did on the cross. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. That's that whole, it is finished in the past, today, and in the future. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. If you go, I love this phrase. I think if, if you were going to take a verse and, and just have this verse as a life verse, when you think about yourself, Paul says when that word counts, if you look that up, it means to compute. It's like when I think about myself, when I, I think even one of the words it uses, I like it. It kind of reminds me of being from Northport, Alabama. When you reckon yourself. When you reckon like who you are, when you think about who you are, here's how Paul says to think of yourself, dead to sin and alive to God. You're dead to sin and I am alive to God. If I think of myself any less than this, then I'm not believing in what Jesus did on the resurrection. If I think of myself any less than dead to sin and alive to God, then I'm not actually submitting myself to what Christ has done for me. And this is, this is how, when we think about ourselves, this is the lens that we should think through. That even if I'm thinking about my past and things that I've done and regret, I need to view it through the lens of the blood of Jesus. 
I need to see myself through what he has done for me. That's enough to go home and say amen and thank you, Jesus. Like that is the, the benefit of what Christ has done for us. You know, um, Jesus, I, I shared this a minute ago, but Jesus would just, he would, he would just go around and heal the sick and deliver people. He would go and demonstrate the kingdom of God. If there was a demon, he would deliver the person. If they were sick, he would heal them. If, if they needed food, he would multiply food. If they needed wine, he would make more, you know, he turned water to wine. He, he just went around and, and demonstrated who he is. And you know what's fascinating to me about this is, is that he, he did it at the risk of he may heal somebody and they may not follow him. But it didn't keep him from doing it. He did it with the risk of knowing that I might heal somebody and I might, deliver, I might do this and they still may not follow me, but he did it because it's who he is. His nature is love. That's just... I remember I got two two stories of kind of, of, of that's an example of this. I this was probably 15 years ago now, but we were I went on a treasure hunt. And I remember I was in second year uh, at the school of ministry at Bethel, and it was I was leading the treasure hunt. So in second, first year you kind of go on the treasure hunt, and in second year you're the leader of the treasure hunt. And I remember if I remember correctly, it was one of the first times that I was leading one. And I had two first-year students with me, and I remember they were two, uh, two girls, and, and, and we, we went out to this park, and what you do on a treasure hunt is you write down, uh, you ask God for clues of who is his treasure today. Who is God's treasure? And we write down, the, we would just ask God, uh, God, what is maybe what's somebody wearing? And I, I remember that, that I had like a flannel shirt, and I think I had blue jeans that I'd written down, and... I think we might have written somebody written down like a park. And so we, we go on this treasure hunt. And really the goal is, is to go and to pray for people and to minister to people. And we go out and we go to this park. And I remember I saw two guys sitting on a, a park bench. And I, I'm with these two girls and I, I approach this park bench with these two guys sitting on it. And I, I can't exactly remember what I said, but I probably just said something like, hey, how would y'all feel if we prayed for y'all? And this one guy comes storming at me and just cussing at me. I mean, he is like, what the blankety blank blank do you think you're doing? Just approaching us with this. And I mean, you could tell there was some uh, issues there. And uh, <laughs> obviously, and this, I mean, he is, he's screaming at me. And I'm like, oh, this is going great. I've got two students. Like, please don't hurt any of, don't hurt these girls. And um but but I kind of leaned into it a little bit and because the, the other guy on the bench was like, well, yeah, maybe you can pray for us. And this other guy was just screaming at us. And, and eventually we kind of calmed him down a little bit. And I, I approached this guy who had a flannel shirt on and I believe he had blue jeans on. And we and I just shared with him what we were doing. I was like, hey, we're on a treasure hunt. We're out here praying for people. And we believe that you're God's treasure and that he wants to speak to you today. And we're just practicing and uh, can we pray for you? And he was like, yeah. He's like, I actually have carpal tunnel. And he's like, he had an issue with his thumb and he had a lot of pain in his thumb. And, and I was like, well, can we pray for you? And he said, yeah. And so we gather around him. We pray one time. We're just praying in Jesus name to be healed. And, um, and I look up after we pray and I'm like, what did anything happen? He was like, nope. He's like, still have pain here. Nothing happened. And I was like, well, do you mind if we pray again? He said, sure, you can pray again. And so we gather around him. And, and I don't even know that I had a ton of faith for this, but I said, and I was just like, and we pray for healing. And I was like, and there it is in Jesus name. And, uh, and then I look up at him and he is just, <laughs> and he is moving his, he's going like this. And I'm like, what happened? And he said, when you said, there it is, I saw a great light shine and something lifted off of me and my thumb was healed. Isn't that awesome. Like, like, I knew there was something on there, it is. That's not really. And, and it, was, it was amazing. And, and this guy was just wrecked. And I, mean, I, mean, I remember him just sitting over there for a while. His buddy, I'm not quite sure whatever happened to him. But <laughs> this guy was just, he was like amazed and, and really touched and so grateful. And we ministered to him the love of Jesus, shared Jesus with him. And it was just this awesome moment. 
And I remember coming back like six months later and I run into the guy and he grabs me and he is like our tour guide. He's like, these guys prayed for me, great light, great light shine, something lifted off of me, I was healed. And he was like running us around the neighborhood and the park and like so grateful for what God had done. I remember another story, and this was just neat to me about the nature of God. I was in Croatia, and we were on a, on a ministry uh, trip there, and we're walking through the streets, and we're just out doing ministry on st- kind of street ministry, and I see this guy who's from Croatia, and he's, he's kind of got a pretty good little limp. And we had seen, um, I had seen quite a few legs grow out where we pray for somebody and they've got a, a shorter leg. We actually had quite a, I don't know, maybe two or three legs grow out the other day in KMI, which was fun when the Bethel team was here, which was awesome. Um, and, uh, and this, <clears throat> and I saw this guy and I was like, well, he, he looks like the way he's walking that he's got a leg that's shorter than the other leg. And I've got a translator with me. We approach this guy and pretty much, um, I, I get this guy. I'm like, hey, can we pray for you? I noticed that you have a leg that's shorter than the other one. And long story short, we eventually get to pray for him. And he, sure enough, he probably, it was probably a, a solid inch, inch and a half. The leg was shorter than the other leg. And right there in the middle of the street in Croatia, me and a team, we pray for this guy. And his leg, it lines up. Like it literally grows. It probably grew about an inch and it straightened up just like this. And it was one of the cool things to see, like God move in this guy's leg. What was interesting to me about this is, and I watched him walk off. And he walked up like this. And then he walked away and he didn't have a limp. And what was interesting, though, is the guy had zero response. There's just no response. It was like, and some of it, the guy's from Croatia. I'm not quite, I mean, I'm having a little bit of a hard time with the translation. And, we're, you know, and I'm like, hey, Jesus loves you, and this is Jesus. This is the work of Jesus Christ and, and all of this. And, and, and anyway, he just didn't have much of a response. I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, you probably been, I mean, this guy was, I would imagine, 50, 60 years old. So he'd been walking with this thing for a long time. And I'm sure probably for the rest of his life, he's going to be like, wow, this is, <laughs> Jesus must be real because something happened. And, um, <clears throat> but what, what got me, and I really honestly, I don't fully know you know, how that impacted that man after this moment. But what's fascinating to me is that despite our response to what God does, he still demonstrates his love. He just demonstrates his love. And, and sometimes I do think as Christians, we kind of, I kind of call it funny theology. We, we, we come up with, with things that, that are, to me, there's sometimes they're like partially true. It's like, it's not about the gifts. It's about the gift giver, which is, partially true. There's some truth in there, but you, we need to remember that it's the, give, the gift giver that's giving the gifts. It's actually him that is, is giving away of himself. Jesus, it's, it's like the parable of the, sow, of the sower. He would just go and, and throw his seed, and it was, some of the seed would land on good soil. Some of the seed would land on rocky soil. Some of the seed would, you know, land on the, 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 the soil with the, um, the weeds or the thistles in it that would eventually choke out the, the seed. But it didn't, it didn't stop Jesus from throwing out the seed. Like he just went and demonstrated his love. And this is, it reveals his nature. But what I want to run, run to today that is so true is, is why does he do this? It's because he loves us. It's because he wants relationship with us. Why, does he, why did he hang on that cross? Why does he heal the sick and demonstrate his love? Because ultimately he is after hearts. He's after people. He wants, he, he's, he's demonstrating this. And he is, I think it's one of the fun things that we can become like Christ where we just go and love people. And we can just love them. And we can give away the kingdom. And we can pray for the sick and watch God show up in people's lives. And, and God will heal the man that doesn't respond well and the man that does respond well. Just because that's just who he is. But his heart is for, and I really felt this in my heart for us today, is that it's that he's on the throne. But is he on the throne of my heart? Like he's on the throne. 
The truth is, is that he's on the throne now. These benefits that he has given us, this grace that he's poured out on us, it's true yesterday, it's true today, it's going to be true tomorrow. But at the end of the day, the heart of the resurrection, the heart of all of this is reconciliation, is that he wants our heart. He wants reconciliation with us. He wants to know you, and he wants you to know him. He wants to know you, and he wants you to know him. Early in Jesus' discipleship, the, really the beginning of Jesus' discipleship program, it started with some simple words. He just said, hey, come follow me. Just come follow me. Just come. You know, he didn't, he didn't start with a, a, a message of salvation, which he hadn't died on the cross yet. But he, just, he started with, I, what I want is I want you. I actually want you, and I want you to come follow me. I did a little research. I shared this on Good Friday, and um, <clears throat> I think it, it, Jesus walked about is over three thousand miles during his earthly ministry. I think that's kind of if you calculate from a biblical, you know, somebody did some research and kind of figured that out throughout the Gospels. It's believed that he walked about over twenty thousand miles throughout his lifetime. If you kind of look at his his pre life of before he was with his disciples, but three thousand miles. You know, if the disciples walked a good portion of that with him, that's a lot of walking. That's a lot of space. Uh, from Atlanta to L.A. is, some, is a little over 2,000 miles. So it just kind of gives you a picture of like, this is a lot of walking that Jesus did. And his, he told his disciples, hey, come, come walk with me. Come be with me. Come experience who I am. Because he was pulling on something deeper. He was pulling on their hearts. And, and there was a moment in Jesus' discipleship program um, that I think was, was a moment that he was driving towards. I think it was a moment where this, is, this was what Jesus was after with his 12. And he, he poses this question with them. He says, who do men say that I am? Who do, who do the people of the day say that I am? And he, they said, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're a prophet of old. And it's interesting, it's, a, it's such a Jesus, when you really think about it, these questions are so powerful. It's the logos. It's, it's this powerful word because the question is still true today. It's like, who do people say that God is today? Who do people say that Jesus is in the day that we live in? You know, he was a teacher. He was, you know, an influence. I mean, some people don't even believe he was a real figure. Some people don't believe he, he died. Some people, what, obviously he died. Um, but he, <clears throat> all the different thoughts that people have about who Jesus is. But he, Jesus takes this a, a step further and he asks his disciples, but who do you say that I am? And that's a powerful question that echoes throughout all of time. And it's a question that, that I think as we're following God, and I, I love this idea that disciples belonged before they believed, that they belonged with Jesus, that even some of them, even after the, the resurrection, they were still trying to figure out who is this, the Son of God, that they... <clears throat> But they belonged with him. They walked with him. They were with him. And, and they get to this moment where Jesus poses this question to them, and he asks them, who do you say that I am? And Peter, I think it's so powerful, Peter speaks up as Peter does. And, and Peter, he says, you're, you're the son of God. You're, 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 the, you're the Messiah, you and 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 what's what Jesus says something that I think is really significant is he says that flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Why is that so significant? Jesus was actually there in the flesh and blood. I think what Jesus was saying is that you have developed your own relationship with the Father. That through being with me, you have the impact of that, the fruit, the result of that is that now you have your own relationship with him, that you didn't hear this just from me, but you heard this from God. And that right there is the, the purpose of, of what God has for us. You know, the word life in Hebrew, the, the, the definition of it is plural. And what's, what's neat about that, it implies that you can't have life outside of union. You can't have life outside of, I, I, am, I am nothing without Christ, but I can do all things with him. And there's a, there's a, if I am going to, 
experience the fullness of life, eternal life, then I can't do that outside of him. I can't, I'm not, um, I'm not fully going to live in the, the purpose, the calling. I'm not going to experience life. And, and Jesus, he, this is what, by design, Jesus is like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. At another time, he said, I am the resurrection. And that the, the purpose of that by design is that I, I'm not going to step into what God has for me outside of relationship with him. I'm not going to get to the Father. I'm not going to live from heaven to earth. I'm not going to experience truth and life and the way outside of walking with him, outside of living with him. It, it, it reminds me of, of my, my journey in the, in the scripture. <clears throat> Jesus, there's a moment that Jesus has, and he says, you search the scriptures because in them you think is eternal life, but the scriptures actually testify of me. I love that word search. He's like, because today, the truth is, is that all of us are searching. The truth is that, that we're, then they were searching the scriptures to find him. Today, I could be searching pornography. I could be searching success. I could be, there's a lot of things that I could be searching to find ultimate life. That we, we search for things. And I, I remember my season of life when I was in the fraternity. And I was, you know, this was 20 years ago. More than 20, maybe now, 21. 21 years ago. I, I remember being in that place of, of living a life that was in rebellion to God, living a life that, that wasn't in the ways of God. And I remember coming to that place. It's almost like the, the prodigal son where you, you're, you've, you've walked so far away from the goodness of God that you come to your senses, that you come to that moment where it's like, man, I've, I've you know, Beer is not getting me there. <laughs> Drugs is not getting me there. The party lifestyle and all of that. Uh, I, I mean, I remember the, an, an impact that on my life where one time it just, it just got me because all of a sudden my nose started to bleed. And it was because of some of the things that I was doing to my body. And I just remember in that moment thinking like, this is death. Like this, 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 where this leads is not to life. Where this is taking me is not to a place that is bringing life to my body. And I, I remember sitting on my futon. I think it was room eight and yield, giving my hands. I was in the room, my room by myself and lifting my hands to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I'm done. I'm yours. God, I am, I am at the bottom of this place, and Lord, I give you my life. I give you everything that I have. I've, I, I want to follow you and pursue you for the rest of my life. And, man, in that, like, I just remember experiencing going from fear, going to, to life, going from hurt and pain and being scared and walking in so much fear to all of a sudden feeling hope and joy and peace and the life of God. And this all comes out of relationship for, with him. And the question for each of us, and I just feel this, you know, I, I would imagine a lot of us in the room have been walking with God for a long time, but I, but I do feel God pulling our hearts. I feel like this intimacy with him where Jesus might even just be saying again, like, just come follow me. Just come be with me. Come walk with me. I love you. I'm for you. And I want you. The whole purpose of the cross was reconciliation. The whole purpose of why he did this is because he wants relationship with us. He wants us. If I had to sum up Christianity, I think Christianity is, I think it's, it's really two things. It's, it's union and it's partnership. It's, you could say it however you want to say it. It's relationship and it's partnering with Jesus to demonstrate his kingdom on the earth. That it's about a marriage. It's about us coming to him and walking in intimacy with him and demonstrating his kingdom on the earth. I'm going to have Michaela come up. <clears throat> I, um, <clears throat> I encourage you today to be grateful for the, for the benefits that God has given you. I encourage us today to have a heart of gratitude for what Christ has done for us. He's poured out everything for us. And we can, be, we can be thankful for that. We can be so thankful. We can be the happiest people on the planet. Isn't it awesome that, that no matter what's happening, 
I think when, when Jesus was with his disciples and they were, he was communicating to them that he's leaving, but it's better for me to go. And that would have been probably the most confusing thing in the world. Probably would have been like, what in the world are you talking about? It's better for you to go. Like, do you see what you're doing on the earth? Do you see what's happening? And I think they were so ready to crown him. And they had it so in their mind that he was going to be like King David on the earth. And he's like, hey, but I'm leaving. And it's better that I go because the Holy Spirit's going to come. And it's not just going to be him living in one person, but it's going to be him living in everybody. And you know what? Because of that, you're going to be able to do greater works than I can do. Because of that, because the Holy Spirit is actually going to live my spirit, I'm going to live in every single one of you. And the multiplication of that, the impact of that, and I believe so much of the fruit and good things that we've seen even over the past 2,000 years has been because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit on the earth. has been because the Spirit of God is moving on the earth. He's moving in people's hearts. But he was telling his disciples that I'm leaving. But he said, take courage because I've overcome the world. Today, Jesus has overcome the world. He's overcome it all. The confusion that's running rampant in our country, the the wildness that's going on, you know what? He has overcome the world. We can still stand and trust God and we can cheer that word of be of good good be of good courage. One of the definitions is cheer up. You can actually cheer up. You can actually be excited about what Christ has done. That no matter even if you take this down to my personal life, what's happening in my life today, <clears throat> I can guarantee you there's stuff in the room that we're navigating that's hard, that's difficult. But in the midst of that, you can cheer up. In the midst of that, I can trust God. I can lean on what he has done, what he did on that cross and in the resurrection of him that he is on the throne and I can be of good cheer. And you know what else? Is we can partner with him to change the world. We can demonstrate heaven wherever we go. Jesus knew, because he said it, that he was going to bring a sword as well. He also wasn't afraid to expose the darkness. He also wasn't afraid to speak the truth. He wasn't, he knew that I'm going to, when I come, I'm going to set families against each other because some people are going to follow me and not everybody's going to love that. (laughs) Not everybody's going to be for us giving our life to him. But that sacrifice is so small compared to what we gain in him. It's so small for what we gain for following him. If you can, can you stand with me? I want to... I just feel this in my my spirit, my bones today. That I believe God's got something special for Birmingham. I believe God's got something special for, for our city. I believe God wants to do something in Birmingham, Alabama, in this group of people, in other groups of people that have given their lives to him that I believe God wants to do something that can shape history, that can really turn the hearts of people. And so, Father, on this this Resurrection Sunday, as we as a body are here to lift up your name and to celebrate what you've done on the earth, God, I pray for a great move of your presence. Lord, I pray that it would start with me It would start with the people in this room. God, that we would be people that walk with you. That we would be people that live out this reconciled life. That walk in the benefits that you have given us. That God, we don't discredit them or disqualify them, but God, we actually receive them. And we walk in them. Yep, in Jesus' name.